We're so excited. We're having a Lava Lava Luau. It's June 7th through the 11th, and we want your kids involved. It's going to be at from 10 to 2, and so if you would like to get more information on that, you can see someone at the kiosk after the service, or someone in the children's ministry will give you more information, and as we get closer to it, we'll have forms and things for you to fill out. So just mark your calendars and be ready. And then next, I wanted to let you know that we have two opportunities for you to get involved and volunteer here at Grace. The first um, volunteer opportunity is with our media team. You know, taking videos of me again. If you would like to be a part of our media team, we'd love to teach you. We do lights and uh, the soundboard and all the visuals and things. And if you have a gift or no gift at all, but have an interest in helping, we'd love to get you plugged in. You can see anybody on stage and they'll direct you to the right person. And and the second place is our children's ministry. Man, are we growing, and what a blessing. But we need you, we need volunteers. So if you'd like to volunteer one of your Sundays to be a part of our children's ministry, we'd love to get you involved. You can see anybody again on the stage, can direct you to the right people to get you plugged in, or someone at the kiosk after the service will I'll give you more information. And then last and uh, is our Wednesday night Bible study. We love to get back together again in the middle of the week. And when we do that, six o'clock we have a family meal, and then at seven we get in God's Word together. And I want to encourage you to come and be a part because as we're getting in God's Word as adults, our children are in the children's ministry, and they're doing fantastic, fun things. And so is our youth. It's just a great time to pick me up in the middle of the week. And I want to encourage you to come and be a part of our Wednesday nights. And then lastly is our tithe. You know, here at Grace, we have two opportunities for you to tithe. You can do your tithe online on our website, or you can come up throughout the worship service and come right up to the altar up here and give your tithe. So those are the announcements that I have for you. And so what I'm going to do real quickly is I'm going to pray over you in our service and pray over our offering. So let's pray. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful Sunday. And Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do in your presence and being here. Lord, I just pray that you'd be with everyone who's in person and who's watching online. Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless our ministries, our youth ministry, our children's ministry, the VBS, and the Mother's Day Breakfast, Lord. I just pray that you'd be a part of all of that. And Lord, we just pray for our pastor as he comes to speak, that you would speak through him, that you would use him mightily. And Lord, I pray that if anybody's here and they're, for the first time, they're listening to your word, and I pray that their hearts and minds would be open to your word and that they'd be drawn to you, and that if they don't have a relationship with you, that they would come into a day of salvation today. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We pray for our tithes and offerings, that you would use it to further your ministry and kingdom. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand back up and worship. Okay, here we go. Set the captives free. Thank you, Lord. You came to bring us liberty. My sin and my rejection met your blood and my acceptance. Now I'm alive to bring you praise. Yeah. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. Every chain, every chain is broken through you, Jesus. Where the Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. Whoa. every sin yes it has your grace empowers me to win aren't you glad church my pain and my oppression met your blood and my acceptance now I'm alive to bring you praise yeah. where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom chain is broken through you, Jesus. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Whoa. 
this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you. Who you 
There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along, yes, you did, and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Sing it out, oh, there is nothing. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. To show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Thank you, Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Sing it out. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Sing it again. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing, oh, nothing is better than you. Oh. You turn morning to dancing, you give beauty for ashes, yeah.
How many of you guys like that song? Hey, Justin, won't you just, just stay right there just for a second? I, I, I might need you for a second. One of the great lines in that song, and there's, there's multitudes, every line's a great line in that song, uh, that always seems to jump out when I listen to it, I put emphasis on it, is that he knows all my weaknesses, but yet he still calls me friend. And, and, and then the phrase, you turn shame into glory. I don't know about you, but have you ever been, I mean, life's hard and we all make so, such mistakes and take the wrong direction and do all this stuff. And, and we just wish we could make the shame go away. And we try. We try with every ounce of our being to make it go away. Can I get an amen? amen? But he's the only one who can do it. He's the only one who can do it. And I'd just like to, just us to pray over the audience this morning. Maybe someone's here that says, look, that song was about my life. That song spoke to me, and I, I, honestly, you feel uncomfortable, you feel nervous, and you feel that I wish that I knew him who could take my life and reshape it. Would you bow your heads with me right now? I know this is not part of the script, this is not part of the regular, but I just feel very sensitive to the Holy Spirit this morning. Would you just bow your heads and say, Pastor, I need you to pray for me that God would reshape my life. With every head bowed, and you, it would just lift your hand and say, I'm asking the Lord to reshape my life here this morning. Just raise your hand. I see hands all over the building. God bless you. And God bless you. God bless you. You can put your hands down. That just tells me the Holy Spirit has been speaking to a lot of hearts here this morning. It really does. It also tells me there are people in this audience that are so unsure that God could change their situation. Totally so unsure because their situation is just so big, they don't think God can do it. And that's going to require a big act of faith on your part. 
And that's what I'm going to be preaching about. I'm going to be teaching you about faith. But before I ever do that, I want you to experience the idea that God loves you right now as you are. As you are, God loves you. Did you get that? You don't have to change anything. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to sign any papers, make any pledges, pray any prayers for God to love you as you are. Isn't that good news? That's good news. That's the very nature of God, and we live in a world that has a concept that, that our bad is so overwhelming that God can't love us. God is bigger than any overwhelming concept of what the world has of Him. God loves you right where you're at. You don't have to do anything. But this is what I'm going to ask you to do this morning. If you feel unloved, if you feel like you're outside the very presence of God's embracing love, and you're not even sure if God could love you, I want you to stand right where you're, right where you're sitting. I want you to stand. It's going to take all the courage you could ever do. Just stand right now, and God's going to wreck. God bless you. God bless you and you. There another. You're shaking, your hands are trembling a little bit. You say, I feel so uncomfortable. I'm not trying to make you feel uncomfortable. I'm trying to, to introduce you to a God who loves you and just wrapping his arms around you right now. I want to pray for all those that are standing right now. I want you to pray with me. Remember, he can take your shame and he can turn it into glory. He can take everything he knows about you and still call you friend. See, we're a church that's different. We embrace people with issues in their life. The medicine that you need is the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change your heart, who will redeem you, and who will love you for all eternity. For everyone standing, this prayer is for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you right now that you have spoken to hearts here this morning. Lord, I know we've kind of put the end at the beginning, but Father, we're just praying right now that you'll speak to hearts and continue to plant seeds. Lord, I'm going to teach on faith, and I pray for those that are standing right now will embrace what I've said with faith. Not with some blind leap, not with some uh, notion that's popular in the church today, but with the assurance to know that you hear their cry and that you know their heart. I thank you for what you have done here this morning. I bring reassurance to every person here that you love them today. I bring reassurance that every sin will be forgiven. I bring reassurance that your word is powerful and living and sharper than any two-edged sword. And I pray and I claim for them the peace that passes all understanding that only comes through Christ. I pray for those with anxiety right now. I pray for those with sturdy emotions. And I also pray for those who have built walls. Built walls that they're hiding behind. That you will tear those walls down today. And let them know that you know all about them and that you still love them. And I pray that and ask that according not only to the Word of God, but according to the Holy Spirit of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Give the Lord a hand clap offering if you would here this morning. Thank you, Justin, for the great song and for hanging around with me for a moment. Um, I'm just, I, I hate to take opportunities and waste them. You get opportunities, you need to seize them, even though it's out of the normal flow of what we do and, and if you're visiting, I pray that you don't feel uncomfortable. I pray that you, you feel comfortable. Uh, we're not a stuffy church. We're, we're, we're a loving church. Uh, we're a, an accepting church. We're a church that will love you. And I just want you to feel comfortable here this morning. Isn't that right, church? If you're visiting, it's good to have a few folk back that haven't been back due to COVID. We still have a lot more to come back. Uh, but we also have new people, and we want to welcome you here today. And just to let you understand how we do things, we normally start with a clip um, to kind of get you on the page of where we're going. And uh, my, my clip today is on faith. Now, I'm talking about uh, 
how to put out the fires or heavenly fire equipment. I don't know about you, but sometimes we need help. We need help on the fires that this world starts. We don't know how to put them out. But we have at our disposal something that will help us put out the fires that the world and the enemy sends our way. And I'm going to help you this morning. I'm going to, I'm going to try to introduce to you this concept of faith. A lot of people don't understand it. Uh, they think it's a byword. They think it's a spiritual word where you can, uh, it's like finding the magic genie's lamp and you can rub it and you rub it hard enough and you say it enough, you'll get whatever you want by faith. That's not the faith that the Bible talks about. You're going to get what you want because there's a God that knows what you need. You can rub a lamp all you want and you can pray phrases and little catchy jingles and all of this kind of stuff, but if it's not God's will, it's not God's will. And I want you just to listen this morning as we talk about faith, and I'm going to talk about it with loving kindness. I'm going to talk about it with, with a spiritual sense that God can open our eyes and the eyes of people who need faith. Because I promise you, if you're trusting in this world, you, you, you're in trouble. I, when I say you're in trouble, you're, you're in trouble for a, a road of all kind of difficulty. Uh, I, I don't know where I'd be without my faith when the obstacles and the situations of life arise. So watch this clip. Um, it's fast moving, so you're going to have to listen quickly. And then I'm going to be back, and you can turn to Ephesians chapter number 6, okay? Faith, the final frontier. These are the voyages, no, it's ridiculous, although that's where most people take this topic, to science fiction. Faith, what is it really? A magic feeling that we get to help us through tough times? A mystical bridge between fact and fiction? Is it really blind? Is it a word we use when we can't explain ourselves? Is it real on any level? Well, let's investigate. Hypothetical. A person says to you, I sure do wish I could believe in Millie Buggins like you do, I just don't have that kind of faith. Well. What that person is really saying is that Millie Buggins aren't real, and you are the type of person who believes in unreal things, and it takes this strange faith thing that not many other people have for you to get there. Okay, in the nicest way possible then, this person is calling you insane, or at best just a little nutty. So you have this odd capability of believing in something you desperately wish to be true, but you just can't be sure if it is. However, since it makes you feel better, it's worth it. For you. Well, that pretty much sums up what faith means to most people. In other words, the stronger your faith, the more ridiculous the belief must be, because after all, a little faith helps you believe in things that probably aren't true, so then their really powerful faith will be the kind of faith you absolutely know something isn't true, but you still believe it anyway. Thus, faith is reduced to some blind anecdotal act that magically suspends disbelief of reality in order to make you feel better. But, you gotta wonder, is this really the kind of faith the Bible talks about? Let's look at the word again, okay? Let's refocus. The Bible refers to faith really in only one way. It's like this. Suppose I say, I have faith that my friend will repay me the 10 bucks he owes me on Saturday because he said he would. See, there's nothing strange about that faith that nobody would fault me for having it if they knew my friend. Because what I'm saying essentially are three things. One, my friend is real. Two, he's trustworthy. And three, which is really a subset of two, I believe one and two because I have a relationship with my friend. Now, for just a second, let's get morbid to make a critical illustration. What if my friend died on the way to give me my 10 bucks back? He didn't come through. No matter how much faith I had in him, how real and completely trustworthy he may have been, he didn't have the power to live up to my faith. Was he really any less trustworthy or any less real? No. But the person or object on which I place my faith is an essential part of how strong my faith should be. I mean, how much faith do you have that your two-year-old basset hound can drive your new Lexus to the bank and bring you back $1,000 in 20s? None, I hope. But now, turn that analogy of my friend and your dog toward God, who is all-powerful, all-knowing, eternal, and incapable of lying, and ask yourself this. On whom does it make the most sense to place your greatest faith? Well, I'll tell you. Anyone who has a right relationship with God, and quite honestly, anyone who doesn't, knows he is the only one capable of doing everything he says, the only one with the knowledge of the future, the only one who understands everything, the only one who really knows you, and the only one who has revealed through nature and his word who he is and what he's done, how much he loves you, and why he is the only completely trustworthy one there is. Got it? Good. In summary, then, Faith in God is always a response to truth and reality and has nothing to do with blind leaps, the USS Enterprise, or wishful thinking. Trust me. <laughs> but, but in reality, that's how we approach faith sometimes. We think that if we just 
conjure up a saying or something like that, then we can get what we want. I just want to use one little phrase or, or verse of Scripture out of Ephesians 6. You know it as the whole armor of God as we're talking about spiritual warfare. And just to frame that, I want you to understand, we don't fight with each other. Our warfare spiritually is not with each other. It's not with other denominations, and it's not with other churches. It's not, I mean, we fight each other physically, even though we shouldn't. We should be peacemakers and express the love of God. But when it comes to spiritual warfare, we're, our, our battle is not with the church down the street or the church in the woodlands or the church in Houston or the church wherever. Our battle is with Satan and the world system because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers. And, and, and it's framed uh, as we look in Ephesians uh, chapter number 6. If, if you take time to look there, you will see what we're talking about in chapter number 6. So it, it's important that you put on the whole armor of God. Okay, because it says in verse 12, For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And then in verse 13, he says, Take on the whole armor of God. Okay, the whole armor of God is, is that uh, the, the purpose is that you might be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, that we're to gird our waist with truth. We have to have truth. Without truth, we live in falsehoods. The world is full of lies, and that Satan is full of lies. The Bible says Satan's been a liar from the beginning. Go back to Genesis. He lied in the very beginning. When God said, you'll surely die if you eat of the fruit, Satan said, did God really say that? He starts perverting the word of truth, and then, of course, he leads and tempts Eve to do what she does. Truth is inclusive. Truth stands on its own. Anything that's not totally true is really not truth. Half truth can't be truth because truth stands on its own. And uh, it's important that we understand that, and it's not a lesson on truth. And then we have to have the breastplate of righteousness. In other words, that the Bible says there's none good, no, not one, that none is righteous. None of us are good. We can't get to heaven based on goodness. We can't get to heaven based on good deeds. We can't get to uh, heaven based being a Girl Scout or a Boy Scout or being part of a club. Uh, we can't get to heaven based on that because there's none good. It's subjective. Goodness is, is subjective. What's good in your eyes may not be good in my eyes. And the Bible says there's none good, no, not one. So it has to come from God. So we have to put on the, the righteousness of God if we're going to stand against the devil. Because again, it's subjective. You can't say I'm good and I'm better than you. But listen to me. Hell is going to be full of good people with good intentions. You have to have what God gives you to be righteous in God's eyes because He's holy and there's none of us that are holy. So we have to have something called righteousness and that comes from God Himself. Again, not a lesson on righteousness, but it's important that you understand. And then we have the, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And it's not talking about peacemakers here. The gospel of peace is simply this. If you do not have a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, you have no peace in your life. You might have a truce, you might have a detente, you might have an agreement, God, you do your thing and I'll do mine, let me live my life and everything will be fine. But at the end of the day, that's nothing but a temporary truce, and at the end of the day, you're going to have to give an account for who you are and what you've done. Because there's none righteous, no, not one. So we have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And, and, and by the way, the gospel is the good news. It's the good news. It's not something that people should cringe about, run from, say, I don't want that. How in the world would somebody not want good news? And the world tries to pervert it, but it's good news. When Christ was born, the angels proclaimed, For I declare to you this day, unto you is born in the city of David, Christ the Lord. And he called it good news of great joy. Who in the world would not want good news? I'd like to have the good news that... Somebody gave me a million dollars. That'd be good news. Good news is somebody gave me a new car or truck. I'd like that. Amen? And if you're thinking, praying about it, one of those Teslas would be really nice. I'd like that. That'd be great. Good news. Good news. There's always good news. You're going to have a, a new grandchild. Good news that you're going to get a new job. Good news you're going to get a raise. Good news is important. Amen? And the gospel is all about the good news. A lot of people say, I don't know if I need this gospel church thing. Well, listen to me. The gospel is not about church. The gospel is about the good news that God loves you and He sent a Savior 
to redeem you because you're not righteous. None of us are. And I'm not saying that I'm better than you are because I'm the same as you are. I'm a sinner saved by grace. You just hasn't, you haven't experienced grace, but I can assure you the same grace that came into my heart will come into your heart. So we shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace that it says. It's important that we understand that. And then he says in verse 16, this is the phrase I want to use, and above all, above all, when you realize that you're no longer in this place, above all, above everything else that's been said, above all, above all, I want you to take the shield of faith. Faith is the thing that allows us to move, and if we ever need faith, we need it right now. It allows us to push forward, and in the concept of this, in battle, without a shield, and you're fighting, and, and arrows are coming your way, you're certainly going to get whacked with arrows. And he says, Satan shoots the fiery darts to, toward us. He'll shoot the dart of doubt. He'll shoot the dart of lies because he's not about truth. He'll take the good news and say, you don't need the good news. How dare a preacher say that, that you're not righteous? Well, the, I didn't say it. The Bible said it, and God wrote the Bible. So, you, you know, without the shield of faith, you're not... And he said, above all, you better use this because you, without being able to stop what's coming your way, you're going to be in trouble because Satan's surely going to be gunning for you. And he uses that analogy. So I want to just t try to help you a little bit knowing what faith is. It's the equipment that ties everything else into working order. You, you say, I, I, I want to have a religious experience. Let me just say this. I would recommend that you do not have a religious experience. There are too many people having religious experiences. I would prefer that you have an experience with Jesus Christ that is non-religious that it's personal, not religious, not with a bunch of liturgy and a bunch of documents and a bunch of things you have to learn, but I'd, I'd prefer that you have a relationship. I, I'll introduce you to Christ, and with Christ, He'll just tell you what you need to do, and it's personal, and He'll walk with you all through this life, and it won't be about religion because religion will mess you up. All you got to do is look at the world. The world's messed up. Can I get an Amen. See, the equipment that ties all other things together is faith. And above all, he says, in addition to, besides all these things, everything else shows the importance of the shield of faith. Let's understand what faith is. Watch it on the screen. Hebrews 11, 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You say, how in the world can that be? Look closely at this definition. You look at it on the screen and notice how odd it is. We usually, we, we usually hope for things that we don't have them yet. But faith is the reality of, of what we're hoping for. See, we, we don't usually say, well, you know, I, I'd like to have that. Hmm. And I hadn't seen it yet, but I'd like to have it. That's, that's quite unusual. But in a spiritual sense, when we hear the concept of faith, then that's the thing that becomes what we're about. See, faith is proof, that, uh, proof of what we have not seen. I haven't been to heaven, but I believe it's real. I haven't been there. I believe it's real. I'll be honest with you. I didn't go to Jerusalem 2,000 years ago and see Jesus crucified when they were crucifying the man from Galilee. I wasn't there. But I believe it by faith. I see it by faith. I, I see it in such a way that it's changed my life. That's, that, that's faith now. Remember, faith is the substance. That's something that's reality of things hoped for. Heaven has to be a reality, okay? And the evidence of things not seen. It's such evident in my life, but I wasn't there. I haven't been to heaven yet. I can't wait to get there. But see, true faith is really, in its essence, is giving up control. You have to give up control to have real faith. As long as you're hanging on to your concept, real faith will not work in your life. I'm letting it settle in, okay? It won't work in your life. And totally trusting in the Lord, as long as we hold on to us, we can't see Him work. Amen. If you have preconceived notions uh, 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 that, that you're trying to hang on to instead of totally trusting God, let me use the essence of salvation. If you try to say, well, I'm pretty good. I, I, I can't believe that I have to totally empty myself out and say that I'm a sinner. I can't believe that I have to do that. See, you're hanging on to something. The only way that you're going to have God come in and change your life is to just be totally honest with God. That's what truth is, right? Coming clean. 
totally honest with God, coming clean. So, as we look at the concept, you've got to let go. Faith is not just someone's opinion or an emotional, unrealistic hope. Faith is real. The issue is not in the size of my faith, but the size of my God. God said, if you've got little faith, you can move a mountain, right? And see, what we have to see is if God uh, is bigger than our problems, that's what we have to see. Or are our problems bigger than God? And that's how people look at it. My problem's too big for God. My situation's too big for God. My, my bad life is too big for God. But in reality, we've got we've to get rid of that, and we've got to give God total control, and we've got to let us in ourselves say, God, I believe you're bigger than my problem. I believe you're bigger than my issue. And, and you, you can apply it to anything. Jobs, health, social issues, relationship issues, acceptance issues salvational, eternal issues, all of it applies in faith. Faith is a solid conviction, conviction resting on God's words that makes the future present and the invisible visible. The invisible visible. You have heard me say that faith is the currency of heaven. Without faith, we, we can't live, breathe, and move. Without faith, we can't really operate. Because, see, if we're going to be pleasing to God, we must believe that He is God, Him. He is, Hebrews eleven six, 6, and that He's a reward of those who diligently seek Him. You see what I'm saying? You, you, it, 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 here's the concept. Genuine gives substance to our hope and reality to the unseen. In other words, it becomes something real. Too many of us saying we're people of faith, but there's no reality to it. Too many of us say God can heal my marriage, and we say that by faith, and we're just going to name it and claim it, but there's no reality to it. And the reason there's no reality, you hadn't poured yourself out and totally said, God, you take it and you work it. I'll do whatever's required. I'll trust you whatever, whatever is required. See, it gives substance. Faith becomes something. Whatever you're hoping for, Whatever, when you're trusting God by faith, genuine faith becomes the thing that you're hoping for. It has substance. It becomes real in your life. There are a lot of people who profess to be Christians. Can I get an amen? But there's not much substance to it. You don't see them attend church. You don't see them give. You don't see them pray until they're in trouble. You, you don't see them do all the things that, that believers tend to do that identifies you with the body because, see, their faith it hasn't become a reality. If faith is not a reality, it's not faith. Are you all with me? I, I'm, I'm trying to tell you the real essence of it to get rid of the garbage because it's all based on truth and what God has done for us. And by the way, the faith that we're talking about, saving faith, God is, is, is giving you the opportunity to have that kind of faith. He wants you to have that kind of faith. And this kind of faith stands against the enemy. And if we ever need the kind of faith that stands against the enemy, it's right now. The crowd's against us. The system's against us. So, understanding a little bit more about faith. And believe me, I can go much, much deeper in this word, pistos, faith. I can go much, much diff, uh, uh, deeper into it. But I, again, my, my motive here is to help you, above all, have this shield of faith so that you can move forward. So let's talk about living on the offensive. If you have faith, and the purpose of the, the shield of faith, above all, take the shield of faith. Okay? And the whole purpose is that. So when Satan shoots the fiery darts, when he shoots the arrows, they're really not darts, but that's how the word translates. It's a long arrow, and the faith of uh, the shield in, in that day would be a, a leather shield or a metal shield. If it were leather, it was soaked in oil. And they would shoot, and, the, and, the, and the, the coating on that would quench the fiery darts of that. Or they would dip it even in water on those skins that were really thick. In other words, the enemy shoots, it doesn't do anything. Okay, but if you don't have a shield of faith, you're in trouble. And, and so if you have the shield of faith, you're moving forward. You're not moving backwards. You're moving forward. Understand, the church has become static. We become fortresses. We were never intended to be a fortress. We're intended to be a haven. We're, we're intended to be a hospital. We're, we're intended to be a home for the homeless. We're intended to be a refuge, but we're never intended to be a fortress. In other words, we don't want Satan. Our fortress is we built walls around us, and we just let Satan come, and we'll defend him from in here. No, no, no. we got to be on the offensive, and the church is not a building. The church are believers. 
We're not called to be fortress. A church standing still can't be obedient to the Great Commission. You can't be obedient to the Great Commission if, this is, if we're static because it's certainly not a threat to the enemy. The gates of hell, Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Why? Because the church is moving forward with the shield of faith attacking what Satan's trying to do. Attacking the gates of hell. We're not sitting here in hell over there. But I think the world today has become, uh, the church today has become very static instead of moving on the offensive. We're afraid that we'll get labeled when the fiery darts comes about politics or social issues or division. So we just keep our mouths shut because they put fear out there. Listen, as long as we're obeying Scripture and following the Word of God, we don't have to be afraid. We can say what we need to say based on what God told us to say. But I will say this, it'll be in kindness, it'll be in love, and it'll be framed and wrapped up in the very reverence that God wants it to be in. That, that's the very nature of it. So we've been, we've been called to, be, uh, to live on the offensive. Matthew 28, I think this is important, and we see this. It's not static. Matthew 28, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you to do. And he said, I'm always, I'm, I'm always going to be with you in the age. So what do you tell us to do? Go, not sit. Go. I feel some churches have become this fortress, this place where people come, gather all the information, get all the sermons, all the lessons, read all the books, sing all the songs, and we just come back next week and we sit. And I, I do want you to come back next week and sit. But when you leave here from Monday through Saturday, I want you doing what we've learned to do in here. Not just gather it up. That's the go. The Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the world. So such churches or people see the lost and unchurched as the opposition. I am, I am so grateful that God has changed my heart. I don't see anybody as my opposition anymore. I see people that I look at as opportunity. You say they might not be of the same persuasion as we are. They might be of a, spirit, a different culture or a different spiritual upbringing. They might have a whole different look at life. That, that's, that's great. I look at it as opportunity, not someone that's opposition. Because Jesus looked at it as opportunity and not as opposition. When I look at all the miraculous things that Jesus did with the woman caught in the act of adultery, Rahab the harlot, what God did with her. When I look at a murderer named Paul or Saul of Tarsus, later the Apostle Paul, when I look at Zacchaeus, the great extortioner and hit man that was in a mob, when I look at all of those people, or Matthew, or Peter, who was declared himself a sinful man, I can go all through Scripture and talk about the miraculous work that they did. Th th those people were not Jesus' opposition, they were His opportunity. And isn't it amazing? Those are the stories we remember the most when we see the outcasts come and we see the great opportunity that it is. We miss many opportunities to please God because, see, real faith, real faith, we must believe that He is a rewarder, that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. When you seek God by faith, I promise you, you will find Him. And I think it's important because people see it as, a, as, a, as unchurched as the opposition. And it's an opportunity for us to be different. If ever there's a time right now because COVID has come and we, we've had a year plus of learning and opportunity, if you'll look back, I promise you, you can see that God has planted some seeds for opportunity for the church. He really has. And I am so thankful that new people are visiting our church. It's opportunity. It's opportunity. Let me just say this. You look at this good crowd. You'll see this crowd back on Wednesday night, too. Not only is God bringing them, He's bringing faithful people. If you're not coming on Wednesday for the Wednesday night attenders, they'll tell you what, what you get on Sunday is pretty good, but what you get on Wednesday is really deep and good. We get in deep water. We teach you how to really swim on Wednesday night. We're making disciples on Wednesday night. Thank you for those good amens over there. Those for the note takers. They love that. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, faith, by the way, is an action word. Because remember, it's talking about substance. When we, uh, look at the following verses from Heb Hebrews 11. Take your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter number 11. And it'll, you, you, it'll help you a little bit. Just continue going right, okay, to Hebrews 11. 
And I want you to look at the verbs from Hebrews 11 and find the verbs, okay? Now, I want you to, uh, a noun, if I remember correctly, and I've got to watch Phyllis on this because she'll be correcting me. A noun is a person, place, or thing. Is that correct? Okay, I just want to be sure. And a verb shows action of the noun in most, most cases, the verb, okay? So, but I want you to watch this. A, verbs, a verb shows action, and the noun, in this case, becomes the verb. Now, you say, what, what in the world does that mean? I'm just saying what happens here. By faith, Hebrews 11, verse 4, Abel, a noun, offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. So when we look at that, we see the action he offered. That becomes Abel. Abel's not just a person now. Abel's a person in action. You understand what I'm saying? It, it's becoming who he is. So the faith that he shows now identifies him by what he offered. It's not that just faith is applying to Abel. His faith is identified because of his action that he offered. By faith, Noah, in reverence, built we think of Noah, and he was a righteous man, and that's great, but the, we, we don't understand his faith that identifies Noah till we see he built an ark for 120 years. Are you with me? So the action of the faith identifies the person. It's not that somebody says they're a faith. It's not that they say, I'm faith. It's that it's action in their life, and they put it into play. You can say, I believe in God, but until that has action, it doesn't mean anything because the devils believe and tremble. You've got to have action in that faith. You might say, I believe in giving. But if you don't give, that doesn't identify you with anything. That's just a dead word to you. You might say, I believe in God, and I, 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 I believe that Christ died for my sins. But till you receive it, that doesn't mean anything. What means that you show action and you receive it, and now that faith is active in your life. Are you with me? Again, I can go much deeper, but I don't want to go deep because I don't want to leave anybody behind because faith is not meant to be deep. Faith is meant to be applied that a child can understand it. It's important. By faith Noah built. By faith Abraham obeyed and went. We see that. We look at verses 24 and 25. By faith Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and chose to suffer with the people of God. In other words, he chose not to live under the influence of the world. Moses didn't become the man that he was because he could do miracles and it was an age of miracles that God empowered him. Moses became the man that he was because of his faith in God. He totally emptied himself out and allowed God. He tried every excuse in the world not to go. He said, I stutter, I, I'm slow of speech, and, uh, you know, and check this out. And I'm a convicted felon. Committed murder. Thrown out of the city. Had no job with Egypt. Egypt said, I want nothing to do with you, Jack. But isn't it amazing when you go spend some time in the wilderness, it's amazing God still has a plan for you. God still has something good for you. See, what identified Moses, not that he could do miracles, that he trusted God. And he, he, he constantly sought God's faith. He didn't want to live under the influence of the world. And I refuse to be influenced by the world system. I, I, I refuse to be told I'm not good enough. I refuse to be told that, that, that this is just some religious jargon. I believe in truth because I've experienced the truth. I believe in God by faith because I've seen God do things that nobody else can believe unless you see the action of the faith. I can talk about miracle after miracle that I've seen God do. I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about somebody else's miracle. Let me just share, just, uh, just, let me just take a personal moment. Can I take a personal moment? Let me tell you what I'm talking about. My wife had cancer. Uh, had, didn't have, I had cancer. She had a brain tumor 10 or 12 years ago. And it, that thing was big, and it was inside her head, right under her brain, right behind her eye. You're talking about, as a first time, by, by the way, it's the first time I had to get in the deep water and swim by faith. The very first time in my life, my life had been cruising right along. And the thing most precious to me, all of a sudden, she's got a tumor the size of a big baked potato in her head. Didn't know if it's cancer or not. I had to get in the deep water by faith. I didn't sleep for weeks and months. God did a miracle, totally healed her. No problems whatsoever, long-term effects from that. I have a daughter-in-law has had five brain cancer, I mean five brain operations. In the last two years, five. And she had all five of them within a period of six months. 
and she's mean as a snake and beautiful as ever and, and, and all the other things that happened. I, got, I had cancer. I remember standing right before you and saying, after the end of the sermon, I just have some news for you today. I was diagnosed with cancer. And I never, I never doubted. We, we had peace about it. We knew what we were going to do. I went to see my doctor, and my doctor said, look. And by the way, before I sought that doctor, first thing I asked, she'll testify. Are you a person of faith? Are you a believer? And the nurse said, he's a believer, but I'll have to go tell him you said that. Very first time that I, I met the doctor, he called back and reassured me, yes, I'm a believer. He said, you're going to go down there with cancer to Miami, and you're going to come back, and you're not going to have cancer. That's a believer. You say, did it happen? It happened. Amen. It happened. I, I, can, I, can give you, I can give you many, many more references of what God's done. Phyllis had a massive heart attack massive you say i can't believe she looks too good she looks too great she's beautiful it's like nothing ever happened i can only tell you by faith we claimed it in jesus name and we prayed and all of you prayed i i i would hope that we're involved in that process and it was amazing at the result so my point is this faith has to have substance i'm gonna tell you something i never saw her dying never did I saw her living and recovering. Amen. You say, why? Well, we've been through a whole lot. Uh, there's a bunch more stuff that I can give you and tell you about. But a whole lot more. And God's never failed yet. So the pattern of what God has done and the object of my faith is I can confidently trust that. I never saw her dying. Were, were you upset? Yes, I, you would be upset. But I claimed it in Jesus' name. It's not, look, it, and, and don't, don't take that as some genie rubbing the lamp. I, I, my substance and the object of my faith of someone who could deliver. And that has delivered. That has delivered. And I could give you miracle after miracle. Had an extra artery. Had a, a gifted surgeon. Had all of those things. It, it, it was amazing what God did. And all, you say, you, you have all these issues that could go on and y'all could talk about in life. Yeah, they're, they're big. They're, there's a lot of them. A lot of them. Financial issues. Marital struggles. Uh, kid issues. My kids were crazy. I thought they lost their mind. I mean, they grew up, I thought I was going to have to send them all to a psychologist at one time. I mean, it was bad. But you know what? God delivered them all, and they're all wonderful, God-fearing, wonderful believers. You know why? Faith. 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 Faith that had substance. And when you look at that, you have to understand. I'm not, I'm not going to let the world w control me. And biblical models, if you read the rest of Hebrew and you go, uh, Hebrews and look, all of the biblical models of faith gave evidence of them carrying their shields by their actions. Words like offered, built, obeyed, went, refused, chose, all show action. If, you go, if you're going to say, I believe in God, then you have to have that bold confidence that you believe in God and you don't believe in what the world says. I believe in God. I don't even believe in me anymore. Let me tell you something. This is what I do. I, I, I have done learn to claim this. All right? I've done learn to claim this. I don't save anybody. I've known that from the very beginning. I know God does. Right? I don't craft sermons to bring people to make a decision. The minute I do that, I'm going to fail because what I've done, I've taken over that, that point. Okay? When I craft a sermon, I say, God, take it and use it for whatever your purpose is. Now, I have a mindset. I have a subject matter that God gives me. I do everything within my power to make that subject matter make sense. That is the, the requirement of my profession of what I do and what the Bible says, that I'm to rightly divide the word of truth. But I want you to understand this. I am totally 100% confident that God will take and do what he does with what I do. That's why I believe people get saved. It's not that I save anybody. It's not that the atmosphere saves anybody. It's not that the church saves anybody. It's that God saves people. I'm confident. I'm confident of that fact. I'm confident that you're here this morning, you're nervous, and you're saying, I wish I could get up and leave. I'd really be bold if I said, anybody feel like that? They'd raise their hand. I, I just feel like I want to get up and leave. Bold confidence, see, gives God the rise to our bold initiatives through which they or we 
would do whatever God requires of us. In other words, it's action. I'm going to preach with all of my being, and I'm going to prepare with all my being and watch God do what He does. I have confidence in it. I have confidence, if you're uncomfortable here this morning, God is speaking to you. I have confidence, if you, if you really examine your life with truth, that God would reveal to you that you need Him. Man, that's confidence. I can't read into your life. I don't know anything about you. I only know this. If God loves you, I love you. And that if God loves you is a fact that He does love you. I've never seen Him not love anyone. I can look all through Scripture and some of the worst people God loved. I can go even better than that. God loved me. And I've been as bad as people could be at one time or another. Can I get an amen from you? Oh, I, I guess some of y'all are better than me, right? I understand. So the kind of confidence that we have has to show action in our belief system. I'm not going to take the time to read, but James gives us an instruction in James 2.14. He said, What does it profit, my brother, if someone says he has faith and he doesn't put it into action? He calls it works. Works are action. He said, when you put action to your faith, people will see your faith. If you, don't, if you don't make action of your faith, nobody knows you even have it. And it's really not biblical because it's dead. It's dead because it's not producing something in you. It becomes alive when you start to exercise or put action to your faith. Now, again, I'm not going to take the time to read it because it's important that we move forward. Because it's, it's a long, Read it sometimes. Uh, uh, let me give you a third thing. Understanding the attacks on faith. How many of you have ever felt your faith was being attacked? Raise your hand. Put your hands down. When you were small, your parents taught you a certain thing. Can I get an amen? I don't think parents teach, teach children to do bad things. I don't know of any parent that ever taught their kid to go rob a bank or steal a car. I don't know any. There may be some living in certain places that do that, but that's kind of crazy, isn't it? I, I mean... Parents don't normally teach negative things. But somewhere along the line, we, we are taught how to do certain things, and then we get away from them. Because Satan will start attacking what we were taught. Most parents teach their children to be nice. Or they used to. I can remember that if I didn't say yes, ma'am, or no, ma'am, I'd get my mouth washed out or, or, or popped. If I said, huh, or I called an adult by their first name instead of sir or mister or if i didn't say please i didn't get whatever i was after please was always important and in today's social society they might want to put us in jail for something like that i can remember getting a spanking when i needed to be corrected right how many of you i was taught it was okay to pray in public i taught it was i Matter of fact, nobody untaught me that you could read your Bible in homeroom at school. I could read it. Wouldn't get in trouble. I wasn't I wouldn't, uh, labeled a radical or a socialist or a racist or anything like that. I could have any kind of friend I wanted, a white friend, a black friend, a Chinese friend, a Hispanic friend, and we just mixed our culture together, and it was good, and nobody had a big issue in that day. But see, the world will come in and take away what we're taught and try to put their ideas in our mind. And let me just say this. Spiritually, the world's trying to do that today. You say, I don't know if I believe that. Well, yeah, you, you better check it out. Check out what you used to be able to do that you can't do anymore. I mean, they want to mandate everything that we do. You have to understand the attacks. The two most powerful weapons the enemy uses to attack our faith is what we will learn to recognize here today. The enemy tax our faith through worry. Through worry. How many of you worried about the direction of our country right now? Yeah. Well, let me just say this. God's on the throne. I mean, we need to be concerned. I tell you how I'm going to attack it. I'm not going to attack it by people by being mad and mean at people. I'm not going to attack it by throwing rocks and burning buildings down. I'm not going to attack it by hitting other people, especially the elderly, and trying to bully them. I'm not going to attack it by trying to be mean to people that don't believe the way I do. You know how I'm going to attack it? I'm going to attack it by prayer and voting. Prayer and voting. That's the law of our land. We go through good times, we go through bad times. But no, understand this, God's on the throne either way. 
right? And I'm not going to live into the fear. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, uh, I, I flipped over talking about worry. Notice how Satan subtly attacks on worry, okay? It's important that we look at this. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body or what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap and put in barns. Let your heavenly Father feed them. Are you not of more value than they? In other words, what are you worried about? God knows about your situation. He's going to take care of you, right? Not the government. <laughs> yeah, here's the other thing. Let me just say this. I, I, this is for free. This has nothing to do with what I say. We got a bunch of folks that's trying to lead and buy this country off to give you money to stay home and not work so that you're dependent upon them. We talked about the job rate being down and now jobs are coming back, but they can't get workers. You know why? They're getting free money to stay home. And, I, you know, I, I believe in helping anybody that needs help, but a lot of those people didn't lose their job. Everybody's getting money. And here's the real kicker that I really have a problem with. It has nothing to do with this, but i got to say it. I can't believe people illegally coming into our country are going to get money when some of our own people don't even get help that live here, that pay taxes here, that work here. There's something wrong with the plan. Wake up, folks. Amen. <laughs> Starts to work with fear, though. Now... That's, this is how Satan works. Tells us not to worry, right? Stay with me now. He wants us to focus more on temporary and not eternal things. There, the world right now is trying to get us to look at how bad everything and everybody is. I kind of told them that, that, that we're all bad. Scripture says the heart is desperately wicked. It's desperately wicked and deceitful. And only God can give us a new heart. The issue in our country is not political change, but heart change. It only comes to God. They want us to focus on temporary things, not eternal things. Verse 25, Satan wants you to think, or wants us to worry, uh, and, and, and that worry will somehow make a difference. You can worry all day long. It ain't going to change anything. Nothing. The only thing that's going to change it is when you start believing by faith and you put that faith into action. Then you'll change something. So many people that are complaining never voted. And because we didn't vote, we got what we got. Amen. End of the day, Satan in the world wants us to think that somehow God himself doesn't know what we need. Verse 32, God knows what we need. He wants us to be consumed with the possibilities that have not happened yet. In other words, take no thought of tomorrow. Everybody worries about the future and worries about what this. Look, there's plenty to worry about today. God's in control. And listen to me, I've told you before 80% of what we worry about never comes to volition anyway. Never happens. It's just they're messing with us. Are you worrying about temporal things? Things that don't matter? Things of eternity? Let me tell you some things that really matter. The people die and go to hell. Church preaching about political stuff, social stuff, this, that, all the stuff that comes up. They're, they're doing this. And we've quit preaching the gospel to win the lost. I promise you. What does it profit a man if he gained the whole world and loses so? You know, the number one mandate for the, for the watchman, the Bible talks about, that's the preacher, the watchman, is that he warns them danger's coming. And he preaches truth. And there's so many people standing in pulpits today, and they've lost their way. We don't preach truth. I promise you, that's important. That's the thing that matters the most. Does your worry imply that God doesn't know what you need or He's unwilling to meet your need? For those of you that I said this morning that feel a little uncomfortable and wish maybe you could just get up and leave, let me tell you this, God knows everything about you. Everything. And He still loves you. And He's still willing to accept you. And He's still willing to, to, to use you and to forgive you. Where do you believe God is when you're worrying? That's a good question. God, I'm worried to death down here. God, wh wh where are you at, God? I believe God just sometimes wakes up and, or doesn't wake up, but just kind of perks up and says, where am I at? Where I've always been? On the throne. <laughs> I'm ever present. I know everything that, that's going on. See, when we worry like that, we are not exhibiting the faith that God tells us to exhibit, that he's on the throne that we can trust Him. The enemy attacks also when you worry, you get afraid. 
right? You get afraid. Somebody used to tell me in school, I'm going to beat you up after school. Let me just say this, worst mistake they ever made. They underestimated this little guy, right? But you'd worry all day. You, and I, I learned in the ninth grade, if somebody tells you that, you're going to worry and be miserable all day because you're going to be afraid. You're going to be thinking of what door can I go out that I don't have to confront them, right? And then you're going to be labeled a coward, and then the girls won't like you because they'll call you a sissy or whatever else. You, you, you'll think about all that stuff. So this is what I learned that they don't really teach you in school. When somebody says they're going to beat you up this afternoon, just knock their socks off right then and there, and you don't have to worry or do anything, right? Your day will be a whole lot better. Now, now, young people don't literally do that. Because I promise you, when you're thinking about it all day, it's miserable to be afraid. And it's more miserable to run. Can I get an amen? Now, I use the analogy of a fight. But many times we run from the issues that Satan tries to bring our way that the marriage is falling apart. Don't go out a side door. Don't run from it. Knock it in the mouth today and say, it's not going to fall apart. I'm going to, I'm going to fix it in Jesus' name, and I'm not going to be afraid to confront. We've got issues, and God, you know we've got issues, and we need to make it right. Amen? Or, or this, Lord, nobody loves me, and I'm an outcast, and nobody believes in me, and I've been told all my life I'm a loser. Don't run out the door and try to avoid that. You've been worrying about it, and who, who's ever going to love me? Who's ever going to accept me? And you're living in fear that nobody will. I'm just telling you right now, if God loves you, there's plenty of other people who love you. Because His love is shed abroad in our hearts. He loved us first, and He teaches us how to love. And if you feel unloved today, your relationship starts with loving God. And I promise you, when you love God, you're going to find a bunch of people who love you. And you don't have to worry about not being accepted by those people who don't matter, because if they don't love you, they don't matter in, in the focus of your life. Because when you love God and God accepts you in, you're going to find all kinds of people that love you. And it's going to take on a, a different scope in your life. And, and some of those people that you thought that didn't love you, you're going to realize they loved you. They just didn't understand you, and you didn't understand them. It's amazing how God works. The enemy comes in and attacks through fear. I mean, check out Peter. One minute he's walking on the water, the next man he's, he's, he's doubting and sinking. You ever been like that? I'm doing good, and then all of a sudden, I don't think I can do this. And then he starts to sink. The world translated doubt in Matthew 14, 31 implies the idea of one trying to go in two different directions at one time. Too many people trying to serve God and serve the world. That's where doubt comes in. You know, Peter walking on water and he has doubt. He said, do I keep walking toward Jesus or can I make it back to the boat before I sink? And what does he do? He starts to sink. And then he cries out on Jesus and what he was, he's walking on water again. I don't know about you, that's my life. <laughs> man, I've been walking on water many times, and I start to sink, and I say, man, I better hurry and get back to some safety here. And what I end up doing is drowning. Because, see, the only way you're going to find safety is walk toward Jesus. I'm just helping you here today. Our greatest weapon against the enemy is the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. And faith comes by trusting the Word all through Scripture. Our charge is to trust the Bible. Faith comes that way. You know, I, I, I've got plenty more to say. I, I really do. Right here. But I'm not going to say any more. Because I, I, I want you to understand this. The whole essence of what I'm saying here today is too many people think and are saying they're people of faith and they're not putting action to the faith. They're really not. I'm, where, Kenny, where you at, buddy? I know you're here somewhere. Come on up. I'm just kind of stopping. Holy Spirit said, slow down. Because I want to deal with, with, with a couple of real issues. Okay? I'm not even, even going to worry about the rest. So you guys up there, you can take a break. We, had, we have, yeah, and they're saying, praise the Lord. Too hard to follow you. Without faith, we're in a mess. 
we're no different than anyone else. If we say we're of Jesus and we have purpose in our life, then we need to see the action of the faith so that it's not dead faith. And I, I think you understand what I'm saying here. Too many of us have played the church game for a long time. Come to church, good service, great song, people get excited and all this. And we just become, listen to me, a participant in watching. A participant in watching. We want to see who God will move on. We want to see who comes to the altar. We're participating. We want to see who will surrender to a ministry. We want to see who will say, God, have mercy on me for I am a sinner. Because seeing our self-righteousness, we've lost the focus. You understand what I'm saying? We're participant. We come to church, we watch, we think, and, and then we're going with, hey, well, that was a good service, that was this. You know when a service really becomes good? When God does something in your life. If you really want something good to happen, it's got to start with you. It's got to start with you. And we come in and we, we look for that religious facade. We say, well, we went to church and I feel better. Coming to church is not going to make anybody feel better. <laughs> not. Sleeping an extra hour and a half of sleep will make you feel better. Amen? Let, let's be real. Truth's truth, right? But when you come to encounter God and that is your purpose, you will leave your feeling better. So I'm just going to take a moment. I'm going to be as real as I know how to be. Matter of fact, I always do better by taking the, the facade off. I don't like the facade. I like to roll my sleeves up and let's get down to it. Let me speak to, to the people here this morning. This is, this is what I do. This is my job. This is what God empowers me to do. If you feel like you're an outcast, if you feel that your life has no purpose and that you're just messed up, and you want to get it fixed, and you don't know how. Again, truth has to prevail. you got to come clean, because God knows anyway. Because, see, if you, if you don't, you'll never find the solution you're looking for. And you're letting the world tell you that this is this, and don't worry about what they think. Don't worry about what we think. Worry about what He thinks. He, well, remember, I said that none of us are good. There's no not one. None of us are righteous enough to judge another. We're all sinners. Can I get an amen on that, church? If you feel that you're that person who feels outcast, you feel lost, you feel like your life is just going jacked up, I want, I, want, I want you to do the hardest thing, and this is faith. This is faith. Faith is simply trusting in something that what you hope will happen will happen. You feel that your life is, uh, is uh, you're outcast, it's, it, you have no purpose, you're like an outcast. I'm going to ask you to trust me. I don't normally do that, do I? I don't. I'm going to ask you to trust me that I can help you. That I can help you, that I can show you the way to find purpose in your life. To find meaning in your life. To find acceptance in your life. And you say, how can you do that? You said, none of us are good, no, not one, because somebody showed me the way. And it made a difference in my life. If you're that person who needs help this morning and would like for me to pray with you right now, that's why I didn't want to, I wanted, I don't want to do anything else. I want to take this time to pray and help people, okay? I might need to call on some of my, my helpers to come help. This is, if you need me to pray for you, I'm going to ask you to do the hardest thing that you've ever done by faith, and that's to trust me. I'm going to ask you to stand first of all. Stand. Just stand. If you need me to pray for you, want me to pray for you, I want you to be honest, and I want you to stand. Is anybody like that? Just stand. God bless you. There's somebody else. Pray for me. Pray for me. There's something missing, and I need something in my life. Pray for me. God bless you.
and you and you and you and you is there another and you see you thought you were the only one in this place that was struggling so why don't you just say pastor I, I'm, I'm with this crowd I need something that I don't have just stand just do it trust me trust me that's what faith is trusting in God I'm not God I'm just going to show you the way he is the way the truth and the life and you'll only come to God is there anyone else just stand God bless you thank you Miss Phyllis I'm going to need you up here Pastor Omar Pastor Cameron I'm going to need you up here Justin I'm probably going to need you up here buddy Mr. Jim just take a roll uh, now, now if you're going to trust me this is what I'm going to ask you to do okay because I'm going to have you to pray with them or if you just want to pray with me you're adamant about that that's fine that's, that's perfectly fine but they can show you exactly what I'm going to show you because they trusted in the same thing that I trusted in and they know the way they can lead you out of darkness and they can lead you to light they can lead you to a life of no purpose, to a life that's fulfilled. Because they know the way. And the way's a person. And his name is Jesus. And Jesus loves you. So, Miss Phyllis, you, you come stand right here. I might need another lady. Ogle, I'm going to ask you to come. Yvette, I, I want you to get over here. I want you to come pray, Miss Phyllis. I'm going to assign seats this morning, okay? Amen. Miss Yvette, young lady, will you, will you trust me now? Trust me. I want you to pray with her, okay? Pray with her. Young lady, I want you to come. I, 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 need, I need another deacon's wife right here. Connie? I feel desperately that this young lady... Needs, saved, needs to be saved this morning. Needs Christ in her life. He needs a change in her life. Is that true? Yes. This is Miss Connie. She's going to pray with you. Amen. We love you. God loves you. All of these people love you. And you are beautiful in the eyes of God. I don't know what you're struggling with this morning, but I know you need Jesus. I can see it in your eyes. I can see it in your heart. Okay? Pray with Miss Connie. Roy, life's been hard for you, ain't it, my brother? Brother Eugene, will you come here? Hey, Roy, how you doing, man? He's just weeping. Roy's unique. He cries and he smiles. Because when he cries, there are tears of joy. Whenever he makes a decision to follow God, he just grins. Brother Eugene, will you, will you pray with Roy? Amen. Amen. I'm going to need some helpers. Young lady, come here. I met you this morning, and I knew you needed something. Stephanie, I'm glad you brought her this morning. I'm glad you're here. I promise you she's going to show you the way, because she knows the one who will get you there, okay? Whatever issue in your life is, it will get you there. Amen. God bless you. Come on, my friend, my good-looking friend. I love these young people. Pastor Omar, why don't you pray with him? You've been on our hearts for a long time, buddy, and you are a good-looking fellow. But there's something missing, and you know it. And God has a plan and a purpose for you. This I've known it for a long time, and I know God can use you. I want you to pray with Pastor Cameron. Amen. Amen. Would you do that today? Amen. Come on, Mark. God bless you. We've got another one. Come on, ma'am. Come on, right here. Jeanette, come here. There's something missing in it. It is. Would you pray with this sweet lady right here? She knows the one that can lead the way here this morning. Amen. Juan, you've been standing a long time, my friend. Would you come? Would you come? Justin, will you pray with Mr. Juan over there? Juan is a good fella. But sometimes life just presses him down. 
and the troubles of life. He is a sweet man. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Ms. Blanca, I, I need your help this morning. These two people are, are close friends. Close friends. And life's been hard for both of them. The reason I want you to pray with them, you just lost your dad, and life can't be any harder than that, but yet you're still thriving. Will you pray with them this morning about God's direction for their life? Will you do that? Amen. That's good. Is there anybody else? You say, this is weird. If you don't know God, it might seem weird, but if you know God, it's not weird. Amen. Is there anyone else? Say, Pastor. See, nobody else is standing, so I'm the ones left that's going to pray with the next person. Okay? Is there anyone else that would say, Pastor, will you just come pray with me? Just raise your hand. I will. I will. Y'all be patient with us. God is moving. God is moving. You guys are new, aren't you? This your first Sunday? Third, second, third? Your second, her third. Are you believers? to, who she runs with, I mean, and, and, and get in there, take some action, okay, and use that, that shield of faith, let me pray for you both, Father, I just, I lift up this family, Lord, I pray this morning, I claim their child in Jesus' name, I rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus Christ and the Word of God, Father, I claim victory, the Bible says if we resist him, he will flee, and the way he flees is when we use the Word of God to come at him, Father, I just claim it, I use it. It's the authority that you've given to us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you both. Amen. Anyone else? Anyone else? Everybody, I want you to just pray right now. You're being a spectator. I want you involved. I want you praying. No spectating. Participating. Lifting up in prayer. your brother weeping for you we just had a come to Jesus meeting way over here in this corner amen we've had one come to salvation in Christ his name is Garrett 
He was so nervous, felt so uncomfortable in this building, and my heart went out to him when I met him this morning. But the Lord also said, Garrett's going to be my child today. He's going to be my child today. And he squirmed and he sweated and he's done all of these things, but he's willingly asked Jesus to come into his heart and save him. Amen. And he's doing that all over the building today. He's doing it. Not everybody came for salvation. I understand that. But were there anyone that there's another one that just came? Good job. Good job, Pastor Cameron. Did anyone else come and say, I receive Christ as my Savior? Just raise your hand. If that was your prayer, that you wanted to get right with God, is, was there anyone else that came for prayer that that's what it was? Okay. Fine. That means we had 10 or 12 people with issues of life they had to get right. Believers, but maybe they'd fallen into the lie of the enemy and they'd backslid a little bit and they're getting back right with God. Isn't that good? That God loves us so much that He still loves us. He never stopped loving us. Give the Lord a hand clap for that. But I'm just glad that Garrett got saved. I told him this morning when I met him outside, I said, I've been praying for you all week. And God started to do a work in his heart. And he just was so receptive to the Word of God here this morning, and I, and I appreciate that so much. You can be afraid, because the enemy will tell you you'll be rejected. That's why you're afraid. The enemy will say you'll be made to look foolish. And it makes you more fearful, because nobody wants to look foolish. But see, when that faith says, I'll receive, it makes those other things, your fear, now it makes it look like a lie, doesn't it? Because God received everyone who came. God rejected no one. God loves everyone here today. And there's no outcast in this place. None. None. And our lifestyles may be different, but there are no outcasts if we put Jesus in the front of our life. That's where our purpose comes from. That's where our direction comes from. That's where our meaning comes from. You don't have to finish a sermon. You don't have to finish a song. You just got to trust God by faith. Aren't you glad we're people of faith? Well, I've said all I need to say, except this. I love you, and God loves you. You can say now, I came to church with purpose. You participated. You were involved. And you saw the results. When you get involved, you will see great results. God will take you and use you. Let me just say this. Garrett, God will use you to reach out to others. I promise you. Tell people what God did for you. How He forgave you and accepts you and loves you. All of those others that needed to be restored. Tell God or tell people what God has done for you. Whether it be a marriage issue or a relationship. Whether it be that you backslidden and being restored. That is praiseworthy. Praiseworthy. What did that song say? He turns what into glory? Huh? In that that's you can sing the song differently. He takes our shame and he uses it for glory. Turns it into glory. That was so good. Let's stand and be dismissed. I love you. Bring somebody back. Bring somebody Wednesday. We're talking about the Holy Spirit on Wednesday night. And boy, did we have a good session this last week. Amen.